Good morning. Welcome everyone to the next Gen4 International Forum webinar in our webinar series. Today's presentation on sustainability, a powerful and relevant approach for defining future nuclear fuel cycles um, is just about ready to get started. Before we do, I want to do, take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have questions for today's presenter, there's a Q&A pod where you can type those in the chat box and we will address questions um, at, at the end of the presentation as time allows. In the files pod um, is a copy of today's presentation slides in a PDF format. When you click on that, uh, those will download directly to your computer. And then finally, uh, in the notes pod, we welcome your feedback and invite you to participate in an online survey, the link of which is provided for you there. Uh, following today's presentation, <clears throat> in the next uh, few days, you should receive a certificate of attendance, and um, that link will be provided to you again to provide pro uh, feedback on today's presentation. Doing today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the Director of the Office of Materials and Chemical Technologies at the Department of Energy, Office of Nuclear Energy. She's also the Chair of the, of the Gen 4 International Forum Education and Training Task Force. So without any further delay, I give the floor to you, Patricia. Yeah, thank you so much, Berta. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, um, especially to have Professor Christophe Poinceau from the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, the CEA in France, with us. He has been working at the CEA for more than 25 years in the fuel cycle R&D. He's currently heading the research department on mining and fuel recycling processes, where he is in charge of developing actinite recycling processes and operating the Atalant Hot Lab facility. He's also a CEA international expert in actinite chemistry and a professor in nuclear chemistry at the INSTN. He graduated from the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Paris. He obtained his PhD in material science in 1997 from the University of Pierre and Marie Curie in France, in Paris, and his habilitation degree in chemistry in 2007. He first worked during 15 years on the French geological disposal program, and then he moved to south of France in 2008, where he joined the CEA Marcoule, where he was successively the deputy head, then the head of the radiochemistry and processes department in charge of the Atalant operation and the development of the reprocessing processes. His responsibility is extended to the whole recycling activities with the creation in 2017 of the uh, research department on mining and fuel recycling processes. He has long been involved in teaching currently on the nuclear fuel cycle strategy in several chemical engineering schools and universities in France. He authored or co-authored more than 50 scientific papers, 100 or more communications in international conference. He has been decorated as Chevalier de Palme Académique in 2016 and was awarded the Roger Van Gien Chair by the um, Nuclear Center in Belgium, SCK-CN, in 2017. So without any delay, I'm giving you the floor, Christophe. Thank you, thank you again for uh, giving this presentation. So thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you everybody for being online with me. So I'm going in my presentation to try to demonstrate to you how the sustainability is a relevant and powerful approach for shaping the future of the nuclear energy and more particularly the nuclear fuel cycle. So I will first, uh, as an introduction, uh, describe what is the energy transition challenge and how it can be related to the sustainability. And I will therefore describe what can be uh, the evolution of nuclear energy driven by the environmental drivers, by the societal drivers, then by the economic drivers, before concluding about a potential uh, roadmap for the, or rationale for the future fuel cycle. I just want to mention at that step that this presentation has been given in Brussels some weeks ago as the introduction lecture of the award I have been given by the Belgium uh, Nuclear Research Center. So let me first remind you uh, what, are the, what is the global challenge that we have all together to face 
as, as a world scale, which is the energy transition. Uh, so it is created by the contradiction between two uh, aspects. So the first one the, is the need for a significant energy increase. And uh, let me give you a few words about that. If you just have a look on the past, what has been the evolution of the energy consumption worldwide, you see very clearly on the picture on the left that it has been very significantly increased since the mid of the 20th century. And it is directly related, first, to the increase of the population, second, to the economic development. And you see that this very significant increase has been accommodated by a new type of energy which has been used in order to be able to meet these needs. So it was the coal, then the oil, then the gas, then nuclear, and now renewables, and so on. So it was for the past. What about the future? So first, about the future, we have to excuse me, to consider that uh, the world population will still increase. It's what you can see on the figure on the left down side. You see that we are roughly in the range of 7.5 billion inhabitants at that time, and it is anticipated that we will reach by the mid of this century something in the range uh, 9 to 10 billion inhabitants. And each new inhabitant will require energy to live for his health and so on. So it will mechanically increase the need for the energy at the world scale. So that's a v first very important driver. Second important driver, when you have a look about what is the relation between the human development, by human development I mean the health, the wealth, the uh, education, the economic development and so on, everything can be aggregated together in a, a, an index which is the human development index developed by the United Nations. When you try to see the correlation between this human development index and the electric consumption per capita, you see that you have a very nice picture, which is just here uh, seen on this slide, where you have two regions, basically. First, up above 5,000 kilowatt hours per capita, you see that you have more or less a plateau. It means whatever the energy you consume, you will have more or less the same type of human development, uh, basically. And, uh, but you see that you have an over range in the figure, which is the lower range, lower than 5,000. And in this region, you have a very close, very tight correlation or relation between the amount of electricity you consume or energy you consume and the level of human development you reach. And you have many countries which, in fact, are much lower uh, in terms of human development and just anticipate, anticipate to grow uh, to reach a higher human development. And so it means that it will mechanically increase their energy needs. So all you when you combine these two aspects together, it yields to the type of figure you see just right now on the right part of the slides, which is the prediction of the evolution of the energy consumption worldwide made by the International Energy Agency uh, based on the uh, consumption from 2005. And you see that, uh, first, if we just assume that we have a business-as-usual approach, we are not changing anything. We, in this case, it corresponds to the continuous line. We will have a need for primary energy of twice more primary energy, basically, by 2050. And for electricity, it's still higher. We will need something in the range 2.7 more electricity in order to be able to meet our needs. Well, you can say that uh, it's not relevant because we will change the economic model, we will promote the green economy, uh, and so on. So in this case, you just shift to the dotted lines. And you see that, for sure, you may succeed in stabilizing the primary energy needs. But even in this case, you will need 40% more than today, which is quite relevant. But you see that even in this situation, you will have a quite high uh, or quite significant need for more electricity, and it will not change a lot regarding the need for more electricity. So first, very important conclusion, we will need much more electricity by 2050, by the next century, than what we produce and consume today. And for sure, we have to think how we can meet these needs. So it was the first part of the, of the challenge. Second part of the challenge, everybody, I guess, know it very well, is the problem of the climate change. So basically, the climate change is related to the fact that we have some gases in the atmosphere which capture part of the energy which is uh, received by the Earth from the sun. And when you increase the concentration in these gases, you will increase the energy which is captured by the Earth. 
So living these gases, you have the most famous one is the carbon dioxide, and you see on the picture here the evolution of the carbon dioxide concentration in the lower atmosphere in the last 10,000 years. And you see very clearly this dramatic increase which started uh, in the 20th century and which uh, increased the level of concentration from something in the range 275 ppm up to more than 400 ppm uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And it means that if you increase the concentration, you will increase the energy which is captured by the Earth, you will change very dramatically the climate. We have already a lot of track, uh, a lot of trace of this evolution, and they are quite famous. I just take a few illustrations. The global temperature you see here on the map uh, on the left have, has been already significantly increased in the last decades and uh, the last century. And uh, so some regions in the world have lower temperature, but on the average, the, uh, uh, the average world temperature is significantly increased. And we have some very uh, practical con uh, consequences already which are visible. I'm just taking an illustration taken from where I live in South France. We have a very famous wine, Chateau Neuf du Pape. And you have just here the evolution of the dates for the grape speaking and from the end of the Second World War up to 2005. And you see that basically we save one month in terms of the time needed by the grapes to be ready to be picked. And uh, it's not related to any change in the wine production procedure. It's just due to the fact that we have much more energy, higher temperature, and the grape is ready to be picked much earlier. And another illustration, quite famous also, is the melting of the glacier, either in the mountains or in the higher latitudes, like in Greenland and so on. So you see here this very famous picture taken from Alaska here. So it was for the past. What about the future once again? So here we have the prediction, which are based on the models which has been developed by the IPCC, so the International Panel on Climate Change from the United Nations. And you see very clearly that, uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, many times we speak about what's going to happen before within this century, so I mean before 2100. And uh, so we are expecting, with our effort, uh, if we succeed, to limit the temperature increase by 2 degrees Celsius. But you see that uh, it's not yet uh, uh, easy to achieve because uh, many models predict a much higher evolution. And we have to keep in mind that uh, it, the end of the story is not uh, in 2100. It will still be increased uh, uh, further the century after because, in fact, we have a uh, the time needed to reach a, st a stable state is much longer. So basically what we have to keep in mind is that uh, due to the increase of the greenhouse gases, we expect a very significant increase of the temperature, and we have to do all we can do in order to mitigate this evolution, in order to prevent, uh, in order to, to have the conditions which are uh, favorable to life. So if I try to combine these two facts together, we reach to what I call the challenge of the energy transition, the challenge we all have to face, and which is a very uh, uh, complex question. In fact, we have to increase energy production. We have to mitigate the climate change. And uh, the problem is can't, you can't succeed to reach these two objectives if we do not change the energy model. So why, what is the reason for that? You have here a complex picture where I just plotted the world energy portfolio uh, so you see the size of the different bubbles directly correspond to the share of each energy type in the world po energy portfolio. And uh, each energy is plotted as a function of the carbon dioxide intensity, so the carbon dioxide emissions per kilowatt hours of electricity produced. And the second is the capacity factor. It means the time, let's say, during the uh, plant, the, the electric coal plant can produce electricity. And for sure, the higher this number, the easier uh, the, we can meet the need for, uh, for, for electricity, for energy. So you see very clearly that we have first uh, the fossil energy, so coal, oil, gas, and so on, which correspond to more than 80% of the global energy share worldwide, white, and for which we have a very significant uh, carbon dioxide intensity. And if we want to mitigate the climate change, uh, we can't rely anymore on this type of energy, or at least as high as we do today. We need to decrease this type of energy, and we need to promote during the same time the decarbonated energy, which are first 
uh, the renewable energy, so photovoltaics, wind power, hydro energy. But you see that for sure they have very low carbon dioxide intensity, but their capacity factor is also very low. So we have a very important question, which is how we can meet our need with that. And we have another type of energy, which is nuclear energy, which is also very low in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, but with much higher capacity factor. So quite interesting, in fact. So basically, it's the basis, the route for the energy transition challenge, which is decreasing the fossil energies in order to decrease the greenhouse gases emissions. So increase the renewables, uh, which are uh, and the nuclear energy, which are the decarbonated energy. And at the same time, that's also something quite important that we do not have to forget, which is increase the energy efficiency in, in your power system. And it was the basis for the COP21 meeting and the, sub and the subsequent uh, uh, world meetings in this domain. So if I just stop here, we could say, well, so nuclear energy has a great future and is very promising. In fact, uh, we can't stop here. And you all know that nuclear energy is very promising in terms of technical approach, technical power, and, uh, but it's not uh, the only point we have to consider. We have also to consider uh, the increasing concern and opposi opposition of a significant part of the population against this type of energy. And so it's what you can see on this uh, recent uh, uh, opinion survey, which, is, uh, which has been performed in the United States. It's dated from spring 2016. And you see very clearly that, uh, in fact, uh, we have a significant part of the population which is not in favor of nuclear energy. And it is directly related to the knowledge they have about this type of energy, which is, we have to recognize, very complex to understand and uh, with some risk, which seems for the population to be quite high. And so it means that, uh, in fact, if we just have a purely technical approach, we for sure miss part of the problem which is the acceptability of the different type of energy, and in particular the nuclear energy by the population. And we have to integrate in our approach uh, this domain, which is a social domain, and it's not the only one. We have also to consider the environment and so on. So it means we can't stop or analyze just based on the technical performance or the economic performance. We need for, to, to have a much wider approach. And that's basically the basis for using the sustainability as a a global approach, a systemic approach, in order to have to try to define what could be the future for the nuclear energy and for the nuclear fuel cycle. So you just, I just remind here on the slide the definition for the sustainability, which has been demonstrated, in fact, to be based on three main pillars. So the first one is the economy, for sure. It's a historical, very, historically a very important pillar for any technical development. So it's never forgotten, in fact. But we have also to consider the environment. So we need to develop an energy source which, uh, uh, um, which is environmental friendly, in fact. And we have also to consider the society. So the energy, our energy system has to be accepted by the society and is, has to meet the need of the society. And the sustainability, which is the way by which we can define a future for nuclear energy, is a kind of trade-off between these three drivers, the economy, the environment, and the society. So how can we uh, improve the affordability of the nuclear energy, which is a baseline for the technology development? How can, can we improve the environmental footprint, in particular concerning the recent concern for the climate change and the overall environmental footprint? And how can we improve the acceptability uh, by developing the equity, reducing the risk, and basing our choice on the democratic uh, votes? And so, can nuclear energy be sustainable is a real question I want to address with you. And more important, how can it be a uh, sustainable? And so, if we try to think what would be the driver for that, uh, first, uh, for the affordability, for the economy, so we need to have predictable, stable, and limited energy costs. And we need also to promote the economic stability in order to help the development of the uh, industry, of the economic society. Uh, and this energy independence is quite important in this domain. So we need also to improve the environmental footprint, which means we need to promote some greenhouse gases free energies to preserve the natural resource, to reduce and manage ultimate waste whenever they exist, and to uh, ensure that the environmental footprint will be as low as possible. And last but not least, we are also to consider the acceptability. 
And so we, it means that we need to develop the, develop the highest level of safety and reliability for our, our technological systems. Uh, it has to be based on the consensual choice of the society, and uh, it needs to promote uh, the international stability. And so what I want to do in the following of my presentation is to see what can be the main trends based on these drivers and what, does, what can it mean for the nuclear energy and what can be uh, the main trend, main guideline for the future. And so I will go first through the environmental drivers, then through the uh, social drivers, and finally I will arrive to the economy. So let's start with the environmental drivers, which in fact uh, uh, is my first chapter. Uh, so the first important driver is to reduce the greenhouse gases emissions. And we have to realize that nuclear energy is already very beneficial regarding this uh, criteria, and it can be very clearly seen on this second figure here. You have the comparison of the greenhouse gases emissions for the different energy sources, and you see that for nuclear energy is the lowest one. And even in, for nuclear energy, you can have quite low uh, emissions if you really optimize your system, as we did in France, in fact. Uh, and uh, it can be in the range of a few grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity. When you try to see where does it come from, in fact, you see that the main contribution is a reactor. And when I mean reactor, it's not for the operation of the reactor. That's the construction of reactor. And in fact, it's directly related to the mass of concrete, tails and so on, which are within this type of plant. And the second important contribution is mining activities. In particular, it is related to the need for handling a lot of materials for recovering the uranium. And in fact, when you look around, you see that you have a strong correlation between the uh, development of nuclear energy and renewables with the carbon dioxide intensity. So it's what you can see here on this map on the right. So it has been taken in, on the 12th November this year, but uh, we could have a look on the map yesterday to have more or less the same picture. The greener the color, uh, the lower the carbon dioxide emissions. And you see very clearly that, in fact, in France and in Northern Europe, we have the much, it's where are located the much lower carbon dioxide emissions. And it's directly related to the presence of nuclear energy and renewables energy. But nuclear energy is part of the solution. And you see that, for instance, we very often talk about Germany, but you see that Germany, even if they develop a lot of wind power, uh, solar panels, and so on, they still have much higher carbon dioxide emissions due to the fact that they need to back up this type of uh, energy with coal and gas, which have much higher carbon dioxide emissions than nuclear energy, for instance. So let's remind for greenhouse gases emissions, nuclear energy is already very beneficial. We still can improve for sure, but we have already performed most of the effort, and it's probably not where has to be put most of the, uh, the development for the future. So a second important driver is the preservation of natural resources. So natural resource for nuclear energy is natural uranium, basically. And we all know that natural uranium is a limited resource. If you just try to see what are the expectations regarding this type of resource, I just compare on the figure here uh, on, the, on the left, uh, the lifespan, which I derived from the ratio of the reserve divided by the annual production uh, based on the uh, BP statistical review and NEA read book uh, from uh, last year and this year. And you see that, in fact, for the uranium resource based on the current reactor without any recycling, we have something in the range 130, 140 years of reserve uh, with the current consumption which is much higher, in fact, than oil and gas, so that's good news, but it's still much lower than coal, and it's more or less in the range of one century, so it can't, can't be a solution for the far future if we just use natural uranium as we do today. So it means that uh, we have a driver for preserving this type of resource. In particular, we do not know what can be the potential use for the future, for the next generation. So what about the efficiency, uh, the current efficiency in the way we use natural uranium? I just present here on the right some data which are taken from the French situation. Uh, and in fact, in France, we have 58 reactors. They produce 430 terawatts of electricity. It's more or less 80% of our electricity. And in order to feed this reactor, and we need 1,200 tons of uh, fuel. And in order to produce this type of fuel, we need something in the range of 9,500 tons of natural uranium. So it's quite high, in fact, and the, most of the lost, most of the decrease or the loss of uranium is directly related to the enrichment state. 
So when we look what is the, uh, so for sure we discharge the same amount of spent nuclear fuel at the end of irradiation after four years. And when you try to compare the evolution of composition regarding uranium, just focusing on uranium, you see that in fact uh, we consume most of the one uranium-235, which is the fissile element, also part of the uranium-238, which is transformed in plutonium. But you, when you make the difference, it's very low. It's something in the range 70 tons. So if you just try to think about, we produce 80% of electricity for a country like France just by consuming 70 tons of uranium. So first, it's a very low figure. We have to keep that in mind. But in terms of efficiency, in order to consume this type of uh, uranium, this, this mass of uranium, we need to handle and to enrich, to manufacture something in the range of 9,500 tons of uranium ore, which is quite high. So we have a very low efficiency in the range of 0.7%. And for sure, we have some place, some room for improvement in this domain. We need to improve the uranium efficiency. Uh, that's something which is quite relevant for the uh, sustainability of the nuclear energy. So saving the uranium natural resource, how can we do that? So it's still a picture of uh, how we fit the reactor, are still based on the French situation. And you see the composition of spent fuel after radiation here on this figure. You see quite interestingly that the amount of uranium-235 in many cases is still higher than the natural uranium. So it means that really it's quite worth to recycle, to save and recycle this type of material. And we have also here in red 1% of plutonium, which also can be used to produce energy. So that's the basis for recycling, for developing the recycling technologies. And you know that in France, we develop these type of technologies, which are already implemented in uh, our river plants. So it means that we are able to recycle the plutonium as MOX fuels, uh, with plutonium content in the range nine, 8 to 9 percent. And uh, so these fuels are already fitted in 22 reactors in France and uh, uh, allow to produce around 10 percent of electricity. And we are also able to recycle uranium, so this very large part of the spent nuclear fuel, as enriched reprocessed uranium fuels, which, are, uh, which had been used uh, some years ago in four reactors in France, and which were also responsible for something in the range of 5 to 10% of the electricity production year after year. So that's something quite relevant, in fact. And uh, by the way, it means that the ultimate wastes are much more reduced. It's only 4%, and it's only the fission products here in green and the minor actinides. So something in the range 10 to 15 canister per reactor per year. So we have a very significant industrial feedback in this domain uh, with uh, the LAAG reprocessing plants, which already treat more than 33,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel, and the MELOX recycling plants, or MOX production plant, which already produce more than 2,500 tons of, uh, span of uh, MOX fuel. So it's a lot to save. In fact, when you look back here on the amount of natural uranium we used or we need in order to feed the French system, it's not anymore 900, 500 tons, 9,500 tons, excuse me, but it's now 8,000 tons. So it means more or less that we are saving in the range of 1,500 tons of natural uranium, which is quite uh, good news. And uh, the recycled material is a lot to produce 10 to 20 percent of our French electricity. And last but not least, we have no spent nuclear fuel in intermediate storage anymore because they have been treated, and that's also a significant reduction of the risk, and you know that risk is part of the acceptability, so part of the societal drivers. So how can we perform such a recycling? So it's based on the Purex approach. Purex approach is, uh, or Purex process has been developed quite a long time ago because it has been discovered uh, uh, at the end of the Matan project. It is based first on the dissolution of the spent nuclear fuel in nitric acid, which allows to separate the metallic waste, uh, which comes from the cladding. Uh, we have also a separation uh, thereafter, which is performed by a liquid-liquid extraction process based on the tributyl phosphate extracting molecules. So it allows to separate uranium and plutonium, which are converted to powders and which are used to fabricate the MOX fuels. And uh, the ultimate waste, so the fission products and minor actinides, can be conditioned by a vitrification process, which is quite uh, efficient, in fact. So I, have, I want to stress that uh, with the Purex process, we have really high achievements, uh, and uh, that's a real success in terms of separation science. 
So as I already mentioned, the separation is based on selective extraction by the tributyl phosphate, in fact, of uranium-6 and plutonium-4. And uh, we can therefore have a separation uh, uh, of this element with the fission products in or with of these two elements together, uh, in particular by the reduction of uh, plutonium by uranium-4 with the presence of uranium nitrate. And so you have here the, the type of uh, complex which are formed in the organic phase and which uh, um, is, a, is responsible for the extraction of the plutonium or uranium in the uh, organic phase. So very important, the extracting molecules is highly resistant to radiation and to the acidic conditions. So we can recycle uh, the extracting molecules, the TBP, is not something for sure quite important because it means that we have a low amount of secondary waste. So we are able to get some high yields of recovery, higher than 99.9%. We have a high decontamination factor with regards to the minor actinides and fission products, higher than 10 to the 7. And therefore, we are able to produce plutonium nuclear grades for mock fuel fabrication and clean uranium for enriched reprocessed uranium fuel fabrication also. So that can, it can be a continuous and robust process. It is demonstrated to produce low amount of secondary waste thanks to the, ex, uh, the recycling of the extracting molecules. We can treat various types of irradiated materials, and uh, the supply and operating costs are relatively low. I will be back on that later on. So, or, well, so that's already a, a good point. So it means that uh, we are able to save 1,500 tons, so a few percent or a few uh, tenth of percent uh, of efficiency more, but uh, it's not sufficient. We are still far from an efficient use of the uran natural uranium. Can we go further? Can we go to a multi-recycling of the plutonium and to a full use of the uranium-238? In fact, it's not feasible in the current reactor generation. Due to the fact that uh, when you're still with low energy neutrons, so in, in the light water reactors, we have a, a, a low efficiency in the consumption of the uh, unhawed isotopes of plutonium, and therefore it means that uh, we are limited in the number of uh, recycling steps we can imp uh, implement. So it's what you see on this figure here. You have the ratio of the cross-section for fission divided by the cross-section of capture for the different isotopes of plutonium here. So you see the, uh, that when you are in light water reactor in green, we are only able to fission the plutonium-39 and 41, so the uh, uneven isotopes, whereas w if we shift to higher energies for the neutrons, so for instance in fast neutron reactors, you see that you are also able to fission the uh, odd isotopes of uh, plutonium-38, 40, 42. And therefore, it opens the door to the multi-recycling and to the possibility of using much more efficiently the natural uranium resource. So that's the basis for the generation four systems using fast neutrons. And I just present here a picture of what could be in a very far future such a fuel cycle in France. So you see that in order to produce the same amount of electricity, so you just re by replacing also the light water reactors by fast neutron reactors, we do not need anymore 1,200 uh, tons of uh, fuel, but uh, only 450 because it's much more efficient. And you see that uh, these fuels can be manufactured by the recycled materials, so plutonium and uranium coming from the spent nuclear fuels, uh, and a very slow amount of uh, depleted uranium in order to complete uh, the uranium which has been consumed in the pre previous cycle. And in fact, uh, we will be able to produce the same amount of electricity with only 50 tons of depleted uranium theoretically. So it means that uh, you have to consider or to remind that to every country which uh, proceed with enrichment step, have already a very large stockpile of depleted uranium. And just by using this stockpile, not having any mining activities anymore and so on, you would be able to produce very large amount of electricity. What about the efficiency? You have still a picture of the comparison of the potential energy production which are within each of the fossil or uh, uh, resource or natural resource which are available. So you find coal, oil, gas, and you have here electricity with uranium in current reactors. You see that if you're just using uh, light water reactors, basically you, can, you have 6% of the world energy potential, which is within the uranium with this type of generation of reactor. And uh, you also see that you need 150 tons of, deep, of natural uranium in order to produce one gigawatt of electricity. 
If you just changing the generation of reactor or shifting towards faster turn reactors, everything being constant, you see that the amount of electricity of energy which can be produced with natural uranium is as high as 7,500 tons of gigatons of oil equivalent. And it's directly related to, that, to the fact that you increase by a factor of 100 to 150 the, elect, the energy production uh, versus uh, the natural uranium. And in fact, it means that natural uranium can represent as high as 90% of the world energy potential. So it's dramatically changing the overall picture. And it really means that by implementing the recycling, you can very significantly increase the efficiency in the way you consume, in the way you use natural uranium. And therefore, you, have in, you are in good uh, connection with the sustainability. So a very significant improvement of natural uranium efficiency by implementing the overall recycling and the, what is basically the multi-recycling. So another important uh, driver is to reduce the waste impact. So reducing the waste impact uh, is something very important because the waste is the acute health of the, for many people of the nuclear energy. So if we try to compare the case where we recycle, so in this case, uh, ultimate waste are the uh, nuclear glass, which are pale, so the fission products are, or the radionuclides are within a matrix, which has been tailored for confining them for the very long term. If you do not have any recycling, what you have to deal with is uh, spent nuclear fuel, which has been tailored basically for producing kilowatt hours, not for confining the radionuclides for hundreds of thousands of years. And so, therefore, we have a very different durability of the two materials, of the two systems, and a much better, a much longer confinement properties for the nuclear glass. And it's directly related to the way these type of materials alter. So I'm not going to detail this picture, but it just describes what are the mechanisms for the glass alteration. And you see that basically, if your glass is within water, so as, as it can be in geological disposal, uh, there will be an alteration of the interface of the glass with the water, formation of gel layer, which will act as a kind of diffusion barrier regarding the potential subsequent alteration of the glass, and therefore we will have a very low alteration rate. If you look on spent nuclear fuel, still much first impression, you have a much more complex picture. It just not, it's not because it's a different picture. It's, in fact, much more complex. You have first to consider what is here in orange, which is instant release of mobile radionuclides in the range of 2 to 10 percent of the total inventory. So that's very relevant. Uh, in particular because these radionuclides are highly mobile. And so it means that uh, whatever you do, you have already a very significant uh, part of the radionuclides which are within the environment. And second, uh, you see that the alteration of the matrix is quite complex. It's directly related to the production of oxidants by the alpha radiation at the interface, the potential interactions with all the materials around, and uh, depending on the conditions, and in particular, whether you have uh, redox buffer uh, materials around, you may have, in some conditions, a high alteration rate. And so it means that it's very difficult to demonstrate the very long-term stability, whatever the conditions, and in particular, in accidental conditions, if oxygen arrives at the contact with the spent nuclear fuel. So uh, second important difference, we have a much different uh, uh, long-term toxicity. So it's what is presented on this figure. You have the radioactive radiotoxicity as a function of time, up to one million years. The orange curve corresponds to the spent nuclear fuel on the right. The green curve corresponds to the nuclear glass on the left. And you see that by implementing the recycling, you're basically shifting from the orange to the green curve, and you're basically gaining one order of magnitude in terms of lifespan if you try to compare to the uranium ore, or in terms of radiotoxicity at a given time. And therefore, in terms of confinement, if you are in a repository, you will find similar difference. So here it's uh, what we call performance assessment, so prediction of what could be the potential impact on, of uh, potential long-term, potential geological disposal in France on the site of uh, uh, Bure in Meuse-Haute-Marne. And you see that, once again, the orange curve is spent nuclear fuel, the green curve is nuclear glass. And you see that, uh, be careful, we are in logarithmic scale, but you have basically a small one order of magnitude in terms of amplitude for the release. So even if we, in both cases we are well below the regulations, well below the natural radioactivity, anyway, it means that the performance of nuclear glass is higher. And last but not least, when you try to think about the repository resource, which is also something we have to think about, it's difficult to find a repository, it's difficult to get the repository accepted and funded, so you have to save your repository when you get one. 
And you see that with the recycling, the surface area per amount of electricity produced is much lower by comparison of the situation without recycling. And the repository volumes, once again, per amount of electricity produced is much lower by comparison to the case where we have no recycling. So it means that by saving surface area, you're preserving your resource. A given repository will be able to last longer. And second, by saving the repository volume, you will decrease the cost of the repository because, in fact, it's determining the cost uh, due to the excavation operations. So it was for the third important drivers, which was reduce the waste impact. The last one for the environment is to improve the environmental footprint. And uh, so when you think about environmental footprint, you need to think about a global approach in which you try to integrate everything. So every facility which has to be in operation within the fuel cycle, so the mines, the enrichments, the reactors, the geological disposal, and so on. And for each of these of this facilities, you need to consider the whole lifetime of the given facility, so what we uh, refer to as from cradle to grave. So in order to perform such uh, assessment, we develop a dedicated tool, which is referred to as nuclear energy life cycle assessment simulation. You have the reference here of the, pub of the publication. And we apply this type of uh, modeling work on the French situation uh, due to the fact that it's first we have the wool fuel cycle, which is available more or less in France. So we have a lot of information. And second, uh, thanks to the French regulations, we have a publication year after year of the global impact of each of these facilities, in particular in terms of energy consumption, uh, release in the environment, withdrawal within the environment, and so on. So we combine everything together in order to have a whole picture for a selected number of relevant environmental indicators of what can be the impact of uh, nuclear energy on the environment in terms of environmental footprint. So what are the you know, environmental indicators we worked on? So we use generic indicators as in many life cycle assessment study. So the land use in terms of square meter per gigawatt of hours of electricity, the water withdrawal and consumption, the chemical release in the environment, the technological waste and radioactive waste production. And also we use some maximum potential impact indicators, which are here on the line. So I mean the human and environmental toxicity, the eutrophication of the water, and also uh, the production POCP of ozone in the lower atmosphere. And last but not least, I did not, uh, I forget, but we also calculate the atmospheric release, in particular the greenhouse gases. So we consider the wool fuel cycle. So you have here, the, I just remind you, the wool fuel cycle, so the front end, which come, we goes from the mining activities up to the fuel manufacturing through the conversion and the enrichment steps. You have here the flow for the year of reference we used, 2010. We have the decay storage after, then the reprocessing and the, re the remanufacturing of MOX fuel thanks to the recycling of the plutonium and the reuse of reprocessed uranium. And last but not least, we have the storage and final disposal for it, the ultimate waste. So here are the results we get. So let me explain you what are, uh, how this figure works. So in fact, we get some uh, results for each of the indicators that we find here for the nuclear energy system. And in order to compare to the over type of energy, we divide the literature, the data we find for the over type in, uh, of energy in the literature by the results we get for the nuclear energy. So it means that if the data is higher than one, it means that the over energy has higher impact than the nuclear energy. If it's lower than one, it means that it has a lower impact than the nuclear energy. So you have here the results for the greenhouse gases, for the SOx and X, NOx emissions in the atmosphere, the acidification, eutrophication of water, formation of ozone in the lower atmosphere, land use, water withdrawal and consumption, technological waste. And you see that we have the data for coal, oil and gas in dark green, photovoltaics in light green, hydropower in light blue, and wind power in dark blue. And you see that for many indicators, it was a surprise for us. In fact, nuclear energy is quite uh, efficient and has a very low environmental footprint, 
even sometimes with comparison to the renewables energy, which, has, which are many often thought to be the most uh, cleaner energy. And in fact, you see that in many cases you have here the ranking, so it's within one and third position. The only exception be be being the water withdrawal, and it's directly related to the cooling of the reactor, which requires a lot of water. But in fact, when you look on the water consumption, because you know that most of the water, water is released after the cooling, it's still b beneficial because we are in the second position. So where does it come from, if I'm digging a, b a bit more in this type of results? Uh, so here you have the contribution of each step of the fuel cycle for the different indicators. So you find the indicators here, and you have the contribution. So in brown, you have the mining. In orange, the conversion. In yellow, the enrichment. The mox UOX fabrication. In uh, violet, you have the light blue in red for the reactor operation. The dark green for the reprocessing plant. The dark blue for the MOX fabrication. And the light green for the geological repository. And what comes very clearly is that the front-end activities, in fact, strongly dominate the picture. I mean, ex with the exception of the water consumption or withdrawal, most of the environmental footprint is related to the front-end activities. And by comparison, the back-end activities is very low. So it means that uh, several consequences. First, uh, if we want to improve the environmental footprint, you have two possibilities and not more. The first one is to improve the processors in the front end, and you can very efficiently save part of the environmental footprint. And the second is to reduce the, the flex uh, which goes through the front end activities, and that's more or less the definition of the recycling. And so it means that the higher the recycling or the most important the recycling will be, the lower uh, uh, the environmental footprint will be. And so it's what you're going to see on the next uh, picture which is a combination of different data that we calculated with such uh, uh, tools based not only on the, on the current fuel cycle, but also on the potential future fuel cycle with multi-recycling. And uh, so here you will find the results for the first situation where we have what I call the once fuel cycle. So spent nuclear fuel is not recycled and considered as a waste. We have the twice fuel cycle where we recycle the spent nuclear fuel once in order to produce MOX fuel, which is used in light water reactors. And we have the plutonium multi-recycling, which is recycled in fast neutron reactors uh, indefinitely. And here the, is the evolution of the environmental indicators. And you see that very clearly that for all of them, it's decreasing when you increase the recycling, in particular when you shift towards multi-recycling. And the improvement can be higher, higher than one order of magnitude, for instance, for the water pollution, the human toxicity, and so on. So we have a very beneficial impact on the recycling activity for, on the overall environmental footprint of the nuclear energy. So what about the radioactive release? Because I just described previously the generic, general in environmental indicators. In fact, when you are improving the recycling, you have a drawback. You have always a drawback somewhere which is a contribution to the radioactive release in the environment, in particular in the atmosphere. And so it's what you can see in this figure. You see that 100% uh, of the wear gases emissions, for instance, come from the recycling and so on. And so it means that if you increase the recycling, you're going to increase this type of release. So what can we say about that? So this release is directly related to the, this type of gases, so Krypton-185, carbon-14, iodine-129, tritium for the liquid release. And uh, we know from the operation of the current reprocessing plant, in particular from the ag reprocessing plant, that the, the impact of such type of release is very low on the environment and can be neglected. In fact, we have been, a lot of uh, ELF survey has been conducted around the uh, reprocessing plant of LAG, and we also have a lot of impact study and they all demonstrated, even in very conservative assumptions, that the impact in the range of 1% of natural radioactivity, which means in the range 17 to 24 microsieverts per year, for the most exposed situation or population with a very conservative scenario. So it means that, uh, for sure, you have an increase of the release in the environment. This increase in, is in terms of becquerel, so it does not say anything about the impact. And when you have uh, more uh, precise assessment of the real impact on the environment, it's very low, and it's much lower than the natural radioactivity uh, in the region. So it's what I wanted to, to describe regarding the environmental drivers, which are in fact very important in the current population. You all know that the most important concern for the population based on the survey is really this type of, uh, of, uh, of issue. 
what about the societal drivers now? So when you try to, when you ask people what are the main drawbacks for nuclear energy or why they are not in favor of nuclear energy and so on, you find this type of results. So here it's taken from an opinion survey from the French uh, safety technology, uh, safe, uh, research and safe, nuclear safety, IRSN, from 2014. And you see that the main first reason for against nuclear energy is nuclear accidents, which is, in other words, safety. The second is nuclear waste, already mentioned a lot regarding this topic. We have there then the facility vulnerability and the lack of transparency. So if we want to improve the acceptability, if we want to have a, a higher uh, acceptance of nuclear energy, we have to think about how we can improve safety. So first, in order to improve safety, we need to have independent and skilled safety authorities. That's something which is quite uh, obvious uh, in many uh, countries now, but uh, we still have to remind this, this uh, important statement. We need, second, to improve the safety of the reactors. Most of the accidents up to now uh, occur in reactors. It's where it's located most of the risk, and that's the main drivers for shifting from the current reactor generation towards the next generation, generation three, in which we would have a decrease of the probability of the core fusion. So it's one thing you can see on this figure here, which has been uh, uh, taken to Mr. Cavdon, and you see here in the probability of the core damage per reactor year as a function of the generation of reactor. So before TMI was here, uh, and you have the improvement with the last uh, PWR reactor in France here, N4, and you see the new generation of reactor, EPR, and so on. And you see that basically when you shift from one generation of reactor or one type of the reactor to the next one, we are always trying to decrease this probability of core damage. So that's a first very important driver, but it's not sufficient. Second, we need to ensure that we will not have any radionuclide release in the environment, even when we have a core fusion accident, and that we could therefore prevent any population evacuation. And that was also a very strong uh, motivation or driver for the development of the third generation reactor. And I'm just taking here as an illustration, but it's not the sole one, the European pressurized reactor, which has been developed by the German and French uh, uh, design uh, teams and safety authorities uh, in the last decades, and which are no, now in construction in Finland, France, and China. And they basically try to meet this very strong requirement, which is quite different from the second generation. So it was for the reactors, which is quite important because it's where it's located, uh, many of the risk, but it's not the sole risk, and we have also some risk in the nuclear fuel cycle facilities. So it means that we need also to think about how, how we can improve the safety uh, in the uh, nuclear fuel cycle uh, facility, so when we uh, implement some process, for instance, the recycling process. And I think we have two main directions in which we need to go, you know, if we want to improve this uh, domain, is first to shift from empirical correlation to predictive phenomenological simulations in order to design and operate uh, the, the process, whatever they are, and in order to make the safety assessment, safety calculations, and ensure that we will not have whatever occur any release in the environment. It also means that if we have such uh, predictive tools, that we can shift from a procedure-based piloting approach to a simulation-based piloting approach, which is much more uh, robust uh, towards any, uh, any uh, potential uh, perturbations. So I'm just taking here an illustration of uh, the type of development uh, we are performing in France. Uh, it's directly ap uh, applied here to the liquid-liquid extraction process, so the core of the Purex process. And we developed for years now a dedicated predictive tools, the name of which is Parex. And it directly describes uh, and accurately describes all the chemical and physical reactions which occur in such a complex system. Uh, describing the chemical reactions by thermodynamics, including the kinetics rate, the heat exchange with the environment, the simplified hydrodynamics, and so on. So it means that based on these tools, we can predict in any situation what's going to occur to our system, and we can design our system in order to ensure that we will not go towards a dramatical situation. And it's probably not sufficient for the far future. We probably also need to move towards what is called a multi-scale approach, I mean, in such a code here, part of the parameters are still derived from experimental data. So they can be bi biased, basically, by the experimental measurements. And so we also try to develop a multi-scale approach, 
the aim of which is to derive some of the parameters which are used in the thermodynamics calculations. For instance, here you have an illustration for the activity coefficients directly from the modeling at the very at the lower scale, and in particular at the atomic and molecular scale. And by an upscaling approach here based on the coarse graining and BIMSA models, which are able to directly calculate some of the parameters from uh, modeling work and uh, at the lower scale. And the interest of being at the lower scale is the fact that the chemical reactions, the, process, the phenomenon which occur at this scale has, should be stable over time uh, over different chemical conditions. And therefore, we, are directly, uh, we can directly use this type of model in order to make predictions. Well, so it was for uh, the first important topic, the safety. Second important topic is improve the waste management. So uh, regarding the waste management, we all know that the waste is severely questioned by the public opinion. It's considered as the Achilles heels of the nuclear energy. And uh, it can be very clearly depicted here on the, once again, a results of the opinion survey on the nuclear perception. Uh, which is already 10 years old, but in which you see that uh, if you have a solution for the nuclear waste, the proportion of the population that will be in favor of nuclear energy is much higher than the case where you have no solution. So we have to find a solution for the nuclear waste. And uh, when you look in more details, what is the reasons why population or people are against nuclear, uh, against the geological disposal and are feared by the nuclear waste, is directly related to the very long lifetime of the waste. And so it means that uh, if we can't find a way by which we are able to, uh, re excuse me, uh, to decrease the waste lifetime, it will significantly increase the acceptance uh, of the nuclear waste uh, solution. And therefore, the question can be translated to the following. Can we reduce the waste lifetime in order to be back within the human history? Because otherwise, as you can see on this very nice picture, we have to handle and to manage radionuclides. Some of them have, are much, uh, have a lifetime much higher than the lifetime of the human beings on Earth. And therefore, it can't be based or it can't be understandable by any people when you are, you are dealing with such long period of time. You need to find the solutions to which remind us or which uh, uh, is located within the human history, which can be understandable, but not within the Earth history. And so it was directly the motivation for the development uh, of the uh, recycling of the minor actinides. Because in fact, when you look in detail, so what is responsible for the radiotoxicity of spent nuclear fuel as a function of time up to one million years, you see that, so first you have plutonium in a range, but it's already recycled. And second, you have here the americium and curium, the minor actinides. And so if we are able to recycle this type of elements, it will decrease the waste lifetime and toxicity. And by the way, it will also decrease the heat power or the residual heat power of the waste and cool the low to have a much denser repository. And it's still a con significant contribution to the preservation of the repository. So such an option uh, can be uh, directly applied in fast neutron reactors, uh, either in a homogeneous recycling approach, so uh, in which you are including minor actinides at low concentration in the wool uh, uh, fuels, or as a heterogeneous recycling options in which you are separating a dedicated flux of uh, minor actinides that, that you can use in order to produce a specific uh, uh, blanket to be irradiated at the uh, boundary of the, of the fuel core. I have to also to mention that accelerator-driven system can also be a solution in particular if no fast neutron reactor are available. So in order to answer this type of uh, development, uh, very significant research has been developed in many countries, in Europe, in the United States. And basically, we have these two types of uh, approach uh, which are available. So uh, the first one is directly based on the, uh, so it's based directly on the uh, homogeneous recycling, uh, which is, which, uh, First, assume that we have a separation of uranium, then the recovery of plutonium with the minor actinides. And for the heterogeneous recycling, uh, we have first to recycle or to separate uranium and plutonium by a purex or coex like process, then to operate a two step separation, uh, which is based on the uh, diamex annex approach, and uh, which has been very significantly improved 
since the first development in the 90s and which is able now in one step to directly recover americium and curium or americium. So I apologize, I'm trying to get the picture on the screen, but it seems not to work anymore. I hope you have the PDF file in order to follow. So I'm shifting now to the slide 29. Uh, I don't know if Berta or Patricia can correct the situation. Uh, so on slide 29, uh, you have a synthesis on the beneficial impact of the recycling activities on the waste management. And you have two pictures. The first one on the upper part uh, illustrates the way the recycling from orange to green and green to light to, to blue curve allow to decrease the uh, lifetime and toxicity of the waste due to the fact that you recover plutonium, then you recover minority nights. And second, on the figure below, you have the impact on the overall uh, volume of the waste, so in red the high level waste, in green the long life intermediate level waste, and you see that uh, uh, that uh, in fact when you're implementing the recycling, so you're shifting from the right to the left, you're very significantly decreasing the amount of high level waste, increasing the amount of long life intermediate level waste, but it has a very strong advantage, it decreases the repository surface, which is the violet curve, and it decreases the repository volume, which is the blue curve. And you see that uh, when implementing the mono recycling, you're already saving a lot in, order, uh, in terms of repository surface and volume. And if you're shifting towards the recycling of the uh, americium, so the minor actinite, which is the uh, last figure on the left, uh, you are still saving a lot regarding the volume and surface of the repository. OK. so. It was all what I wanted to, to say regarding uh, the, um, the environmental drivers. Uh, let's move to the, the associated drivers, excuse me. So let's move to the final uh, chapter, which is the economic drivers. So if you can shift to the page 30. So I, have, I want to, to say first that the economic yeah. optimization is uh, the root of the research and development uh, for the industry and uh, for the in of the industrial process. So it means uh, that, uh, in fact, it's already included of in any of the development which is performed. Anyway, if we want to move forward, the first important step is to ensure that we have a stable and predictable cost, what you see on the left. Uh, and I, have to, I want to say that the recycling is decreasing the dependence to the uranium market and to the potential volatility of the uranium cost. Uh, it's directly related to the fact that uh, the, when you implement the recycling activities, you're decreasing the amount of natural uranium which is needed in order to feed your systems. And so it's what you see on the figure uh, here on the left. You see that your, the four type of reactors correspond to the four type of generation. You have the first uh, generation uh, natural uranium uh, graphite gas. You have the second generation, the current PWRs. You have the third generation, EPR. And you have the fourth generation, fast neutron reactors. And you see that the amount of uranium which is needed is strongly decreased. And in particular, with the fast neutron reactors, where you have a lot of recycling, you only need one ton of, ura of uh, uranium in order to produce one gigawatt of electricity. It's very low. And uh, so it means that uh, you're going to be more or less independent on the uh, uranium market. And it's something which is an important driver. Second, uh, we have to ensure that the costs are affordable. So it's what is on the right side of the slides. And uh, so I, have to, I want to stress also that the backend cost is quite limited. And it has a limited influence on the overall kilowatt hours cost. So you have here a picture, which is uh, more or less the cost that we have currently in France. And you see that the recycling activities uh, are in the range of 2.9, so let's say 3% of the total cost, uh, which is not so, so high, in fact, and which can be affordable uh, by, by the industry and by the whole economic system. If we want to, to decrease the cost of the nuclear energy, because I know that's an important question for the, the future, in particular due to the fact that renewable costs are, much decreasing, are decreasing very fast, uh, we have to think about simpler processes and in particular for the recycling processes. And we have to keep in mind that nuclear industry is still young and complex, and so we have still a lot of rooms for improvements. And uh, I'm just taking here one illustration, but you have to keep in mind that uh, many illustrations can be given. Here, for instance, for the recycling step, for the core of the recycling, the separation, we are able to design uh, in the future a separation process in one step, 
without any involvement of redox reactions, which are more, com more complex to master, and uh, which such a type of process it can be very flexible. I mean, we should be able to treat light water, but also fastened on lighter fuels without any dilution. We do not need anymore any chemical reagents which are not environmental friendly. And we have a much simpler process. Only in one step, we can get the same purification efficiencies and what we do in three steps uh, currently in the current industrial plant. So it means that it's a potential very significant improvement for the investment and preparation cost. And it clearly, clearly illustrates that we have a lot of potential improvements in, ter in terms of economy for the future. So as a conclusion, I will try to draw for you the pot what could be the potential rationale for future nuclear fuel cycle in view of sustainability. So on my mind, the first step is the plutonium monorecycling, but you have to keep in mind that's not the final step, so do not uh, assess what is the uh, advantage of recycling just based on this situation. That's a transient stage. Uh, it's already allowed to have a first step towards uranium resource saving and an efficient waste conditioning but uh, it's not yet sufficient. So if we want to go further, we need to move towards the plutonium multi-recycling. Uh, for that, we need to change the type of reactor, which is the main breakthrough. We need to develop the fast neutron reactors. And it will allow to have a major improvement in terms of natural resource saving, energy independence, and economic stability. And if we want to still go further, we can move towards the plutonium and minor actinides recycling, so minor actinides for transmutation. And the breakthrough in this situation is the fuel cycle processes. You need to be able to separate the minor actinides. And the main incentive is not anymore a technical or economic incentive or whatever. It's only to decrease the waste burden towards the future generation, to optimize the repository, and by the way, to increase the public acceptance. So it means it will not change the overall safety of the nuclear energy system, but it will improve the, uh, it will decrease the waste lifetime and it will improve the public acceptance. So as a conclusion, uh, sustainability is an efficient framework for deriving robust roadmap for future nuclear fuel cycles, uh, it, because it implies to consider from the early beginning non-technical uh, issues like the societal wishes, like the environmental indicators in the overall balance. The future will be an overall trade-off between the economic, the environment, and the societal drivers. And uh, if we want to be able to handle such a complex uh, decision-making process, we need to have some indicators or figures of merit for enlightening the respective benefits of the different options. And so I just remind you that uh, we go through some major drivers for each of the uh, pillars of the sustainability. That's not the only one for sure. But it just reminds that nuclear energy is, has already a very low greenhouse gases emissions, has already a very low environmental footprint, is able to preserve natural resources very efficiently. We are able to develop a nuclear energy system with a much lower waste volume, toxicity, and lifetime. And uh, the implementation of the recycling can improve a lot the overall environmental footprint. For the economy, nuclear energy uh, can be used in order to produce base load uh, electricity. It has been demonstrated in many countries. Uh, we can have long-term predictable costs thanks to the recycling, which allow to cut a link with the uranium market, basically. Uh, the recycling cost is affordable, but can be still be decreased, probably, uh, thanks to the process simplification. And in, regarding societal acceptance, uh, we have to improve the safety by design to improve the safety by simulation and understanding the phenomenology, uh, the phenomenon which are involved in all the processes all along the fuel cycle. And uh, we can also improve the acceptability by decreasing the waste burden uh, towards future generation by actinides recycling. And uh, based on this presentation, you see very clearly that on my mind, the actinides recycling is really the keystone of any sustainable nuclear fuel cycle. And you all know that keystone is quite important uh, in f for the construction in the past, in particular for uh, the old uh, abbey or church as, uh, on the picture on the right. So I thank you all very much for your attendance, and uh, I will be very pleased to thank your question. And I want also to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues, which were involved in this overall think, uh, fruitful thinking about the future of nuclear energy, Stéphane Bourg, Bernard Boulis, and Stéphane Grandjean. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, If you have questions for the presenter today, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A pod. Um, and while those questions are coming in, we'll take a look at the upcoming webinars. 
uh, next month, uh, January after the first of the year, a presentation on the design and safety features of progress of HTR PM um, by Professor Dong out of China. In February, a Gen 4 reactors materials and their cooling dose presentation by Dr. Malloy from the USA. And in March, a presentation on uh, SDK CEMs R&D on MIRA, and that'll be presented by uh, Professor um, Abderzam um, from Belgium. Dr. Warren has a has a comment. Uh, I'll just post. Okay, I think we shift to the question. Yes. So we have uh, a first question. Warren, yeah, Dr. Warren noted uh, you have uh, very well explained the advantages and inconveniences of different energy sources and the level of information for people directly connected to the level of support of nuclear energy. Don't you think that nuclear energy experts should produce large audience television shows or even movies which explain and demonstrate the advantages of nuclear energy. I'm going to have to resize the screen a little bit. I don't see the bottom of that comment. Instead of the existing shows. Okay, do you read the following or no, instead of the existing show that only presents systematically the supposed traits of nuclear energy? So that's a very good question on my mind. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a lot of possibility in terms of improvement in this domain, but it's not so easy. And uh, we had a very good demonstration some years ago. I guess some of you or many of you may know the movie Pandora's Promise, uh, which has been produced uh, two or three years ago, maybe a bit more. And uh, so it was a very interesting movie. In fact, it describes the way uh, some opponents of towards nuclear energy just uh, change their mind when they just uh, go in more details about uh, the, you know, the supposed drawback of the nuclear energy. And just uh, it demonstrates basically at the end that uh, we have to make a choice between uh, either uh, trying to mitigate the global climate change and uh, or trying to close the nuclear energy, but uh, we can't do the two together. So, well, I'm not here to describe the movie, but I just want to, to say that, in fact, uh, when you have such a movie, it's very difficult to have it accessible to many people. Uh, and I just know that uh, uh, the, the movie was not, for instance, uh, it was not possible for the movie to be broadcast on the French uh, TV. Uh, because the uh, French TV companies were not in favor of presenting such a movie. So the question is not only uh, how the, the experts or the specialists can uh, communicate and give more information. We have also an important question to know how we can have access to the, uh, to the communication media and uh, television, newspaper, and so on, in particular considering that uh, in many situations you have a few minutes or a few sentences to explain your position. And uh, you, we all know that nuclear energy is very complex, and uh, it takes much more time if you want to, to address this question and to explain much more to the, to the population. Last but not least, I want just to stress one point, so, which is quite important for me. I think the future is uh, within the young generations. I mean, for sure, we need to communicate in mass media and so on, but we also need to be much more present in schools, universities, engineering schools, and so on, in order to explain more in details what is really nuclear energy and what it is not, and try to, to kill some of the dreams or some of the threats which are just uh, uh, not, not true. And um, I'm, in fact, involved a lot in this type of teaching, and I just uh, uh, can uh, just realize that it's very efficient, and, uh, but uh, it will take time, because it will take uh, it means that it will take years for people to change their mind uh, year after years. But that's a very good question, in fact. Thank you. That's the next question about thorium reserves. Thorium reserves are at least a factor of 10 greater than uranium reserves. How will the use of thorium-fueled reactors change the economic and environmental benefits of nuclear power production? 
Well, it's a very good question. We have very often some questions regarding thorium. Uh, so first, uh, the, that's right that thorium is more important than uranium on Earth. Uh, that's uh, for sure. Uh, it's not located in the same area, so it means uh, some countries have access to uranium, some over to, to thorium, and it may explain part of the difference uh, of position of the different countries. Uh, second, uh, thorium is very often thought to be uh, very beneficial because uh, lower amount of, uh, of uh, ultimate uh, high-level waste uh, or this type of arguments. I just want to, to say that it's not uh, fully true because when you make much more this detailed description of uh, the different type of radiant lights which are present. You have some real issue to deal with, uh, for instance, uranium-233 and the protactinium decay products. And so, for sure, thorium can be developed, but it's not much more easier than uranium fuel, or uranium fuel cycle, uranium uh, base system. And I think that uh, when one country already starts with uranium, if he has access to uranium, it's probably much more beneficial for him to stay with uranium, at least for some decades, instead of shifting to thorium, which will require a very significant change in terms of technology, in terms of uh, uh, processes, plants, and so on. Uh, so, and final point, just keep in mind that thorium is not fissile. So you need uh, first a fissile element uh, in order to feed and transform thorium to uranium-233, which is a fissile element. So it means that uh, you can't start from scratch with thorium. You need, uh, you need a source of neutrons to, to transform thorium to uranium. So, and uh, it's very well described by the Indian situation, for instance, uh, and, uh, which aims to increase the amount of fissile material first before shifting to thorium. Thank you for your feedback, David. There's a question, um, are there collaborative discussions that you are aware of occurring between countries that allow reprocessing in the U.S.? If so, can you characterize the level of interest? That for sure, there is some contact between the different nuclear countries. Uh, I think the, that's uh, obvious. Uh, I don't know whether there, are, there is contact and discussions regarding the reprocessing. I can just say that uh, that reprocessing is included in France uh, in our uh, law, uh, which has been voted in 2006, and it's really the basis for our nuclear energy production system, and it is also the route for the development of the fourth generation. So any country is willing to move or to shift towards fourth generation will require to have uh, reprocessing activities or recycling activities. Okay. There's another question regarding, oh, do you see them? Do you want to, will thorium play any role in the future of nuclear fuel cycles? I don't know if that's, good. that's a good question. Uh, it really depends from one country to the other, I guess. I'm not sure we will shift, for instance, to, for, to thorium in France because uh, we have already access to uranium. We have already a large stockpile of depleted uranium, of fissile materials. So it means that we will be able, if we want to produce uh, uh, electricity based on the plutonium material recycling and the depleted uranium stockpile for thousands of years. So we have no question to access to the uh, natural resource. But the situation is quite different in India, and India, for instance, uh, plan to use the thorium which is present in India uh, at a high uh, uh, stockpile. So yes, I think in the future we will see probably some uh, thorium nuclear fuel cycle uh, uh, appearing and uh, playing a role in part of the world. I'm not sure any country is, is aim to, to have exactly the same nuclear fuel cycle. Thank you. What is the effort of the IAEA on the education of a society with high level of, illiter of illiteracy on the acceptance of nuclear energy? So the, the question should be addressed to the IAEA. I'm <laughs> not even in the IAEA. <laughs> I can just say that for sure IAEA uh, aims to develop uh, the safe and uh, use of uh, uh, nuclear energy. And so based on this uh, strong motivation, they are uh, producing uh, high-level documents in order to educate people, in order to, to communicate about the advantage of nuclear energy, and also in order to prevent any potential use, uh, non-civilian use. So they have 
they are contributing a lot to the education of the population. More in details, uh, you should ask the question to the IEA. In this follow-up um, discussion of specific efforts toward non-proliferation. Excuse me? So there was a follow-up to that same question. Secondly, what specific effort is tailored toward containing the issue of non-proliferation? Okay, so uh, very important question. In fact, so we all know that uh, we are not living in a safe world, I would say, and so we are for sure taking in consideration the potential threats coming from the ter terrorism or whatever activities. So it means that uh, any nuclear sites is very well protected and uh, you will very well understand that it's not uh, a public information so we not go in much more details but for sure the risk is taken into account there's a question how about transmutation of actinides by placing spent fuel in the periphery of the fast neutron reactors well so it was uh, i went a bit fast in this uh, part of the presentation because i have I had no slides, slides on my cre screen at that time, but uh, when you move back to the slide 27, in fact, uh, it's what is called the uh, heterogeneous uh, recycling. And so there have been a lot of activities uh, in many countries, in France, in Europe, in the United States, uh, based on this approach, and they were directed in two directions. So the first one was to develop a dedicated separation process for that. And we have a, a, the family of the diamex annex separation process, which are quite efficient to, uh, to perform such a separation. And second, and I did not detail in my presentation, but there has been also a lot of work uh, on the uh, behavior of this type of fuel in reactor. What about the transmutation rate? What about the evolution of the fuel microstructure with a high minor actinide -like content in the range of 20% and so on? So, Yes, it is feasible to transmute the minor actinides at the periphery of the fast neutron reactor in minor actinides bearing bronchets. So that's more or less the reference, in fact, scenario for many countries. And there is a lot of literature which is available and a lot of experimental results in order to support this option. Thank you. And I think that was the last of the questions that have at least come in thus far. I want to be sure and okay. thank everybody for your participation. Um, thank you again, Christoph, for your marvelous slides and, and energy in, put, in putting this presentation together. Amanda, thank you as always for running the, uh, the show behind the scenes. And Patricia and um, John Kelly as well. Thank you. Both. Thank you all. Well, thank you all for being on online and for your attendance to this presentation.